There was uh, recently a secret project called Tooth Fairy uh, that saw surprise release of a new series. Tell us how that came about and uh, what are the plans for the series just moving forward there? Yeah, Tooth Fairy was the code name for Angel. So uh, Joss Whedon's iconic character. And uh, last year we uh, we were looking at it and saying, we were looking at, we knew we had the license for Buffy, for Angel, for Firefly. We knew what the Firefly launch plan was. We knew what the Buffy launch plan was. And we said, what can we do with Angel that's a surprise? Like, it's really hard in the air of the internet to surprise people, right? Like, I'm, yeah. I'm seeing the bolos every day from you guys about, hey, phase four Marvel rumors, invest in this book, whether it be like the first uh, brother voodoo appearance or it be like the first appearance of some other character. Like, it's really hard to keep secrets and it's really hard to surprise people. So we said, wh you know, what's, what's, the, like, what's the iconic surprise in pop culture we all think of? Beyonce, right? Beyonce dropping those albums is a surprise. And it's really hard to do those big surprises unless you've got a big brand name behind it. And Angel's gigantic, celebrating his 20th anniversary in 20, 2019. Um, and we said, what if we just surprise release this book? You know, in, in Joss Whedon tradition, what if there's a twist? And so uh, last year, last summer, we started working on this plan, working with our good friends at Diamond to keep this secret. A credit to Janine Schaefer, Gavin Gronenthal, Bryce Carlson, the editorial team here at Boom Studios, um, and the, our ops team here, our sales team, everybody who worked tirelessly to get this project together um, so that we could ship it out to retailers. So we let retailers know in January that when Buffy number four was gonna hit stores, there would be a surprise promotional item. You had to make sure you opted in for promotional items and the quantity you'd get would be tied to your orders for FOC of Buffy number three. That's a mouthful, but you know, for the retailers living this every day, we were like, please order up on Buffy three because this is how we're gonna dictate what you get for this promo item. And um, look, Angel is, uh, and so people, people knew there was a surprise character showing up in Buffy 4. And I think you could kind of guess it was Angel because we hadn't talked about him yet or shown him in the series yet. So Angel appeared at the end of Buffy number four, but the idea was now you could pick up Angel number zero and get an introduction to his world as written by Brian Hill and illustrated by Gleb Melenkov. And uh, honestly, like we couldn't be happier with how the book turned out. Um, you know, it was, it was a huge launch for us. Plus if you got, if you were lucky enough to get the one per store, which I got behind me right here, if you got, if you were lucky enough to get the one per store with Angelus, um, you know, this cover is not being reprinted again. Uh, we're already on the second printing of this. You'll notice the second printing has the blue background. Um, but this, uh, the first, this, this Angelus variant, we're not reprinting this again. This is the only time you on on angel number zero you're going to see angelus so that one per store i saw shot up pretty quickly on the secondary market um but and this th and this was a thank you variant we wanted every retailer to get a nice little bonus because what we wanted to do with this is we wanted to put surprises back in comics and inject that energy directly into the direct market into comic shops so when angel zero hit it wasn't on any of our digital partners channels we love our digital partners but we wanted people going to comic shops to get this book and the response has been great you know uh, we announced this about a week before it was uh, going to hit store so that people could go into comic shops reserve their copies um we had a ton of coverage uh new york times hollywood reporter you know the comic.coms of the world IO9s of the world everywhere. And we could not have been happier with the response. Um, and so Angel is now a monthly comic. Issue number one is hitting next week. Um, and then uh, issue number two in June has the first appearance, another Bolo Audible, the first appearance of Fred Burkle. If you remember Angel, uh, Winifred Burkle, she was, uh, she was uh, there's the scientist essentially on Team Angel, the smart one. And so Fred's first appearance is in issue number two of Angel in June. What's really important about all these, about Angel, much like Buffy, which I'm sure we'll talk about is, this has all been reimagined from the beginning. This is like the same way that Ultimate Spider-Man was, re Spider was reimagined by Bendis and Bagley. Think of this as like your ultimate Buffy-verse. And this, so if you loved Buffy and Angel before like me, like I have two tattoos, I have, um, if y'all are Angel fans, I have the circle of the black thorn over here on my chest. And then Angel's Griffin tattoo from the Book of Kells that represents uh, one fourth the divinity of Christ. 
I have uh, on my shoulder here as well. So I love Angel. So I could not be more excited about this. And uh, you know, we're uh, we're doing new stuff. But if you're an Angel fan like me, you're gonna love this book. If you've never read Angel, but you know Brian Hill from his work on the Titans TV show or Detective Comics, Batman and the Outsiders, or American Carnage, which is one of my favorite books. I should have mentioned that. Um, if you know him from that, he's bringing that same like hard hitting like raw writing style to Angel. So definitely check out this book. Sorry to say, uh, good luck finding the one for store, but you can definitely find the second printing of, of uh, Angel Number One. It has a blue background. You'll definitely find the second printing in stores right now. The uh, Angel Number One also features the first appearance of uh, Angelus's. Uh, we're going to show Angelus in the you know in the past. Angelus being the evil evil version of Angel. He's got his own evil crew that like. In the Angel TV show, like he had, a, you know, he used to hang around with Spike and Drusilla and Darla, but he's got like Horsemen of the Apocalypse, like, and I mean, like, you know, like the Marvel style of that. He's got these crazy, like, servants in crazy medieval armor with crazy weapons who get introduced in Angel number one. And I promise you, they are a big deal late in 2019 and especially in 2020. They're a big deal. So, uh, I know I'm uh, unfortunately confirming some rumors you may have read online in places, but I want to make sure I do my service to the CBSI, the Simple Man Comics, all the Bolo bros and sisters yeah. and folks out there. We believe in non-gendered terms too. Whatever the term, the Bolo Nation, we want to make sure that you don't miss out on that too because what we're trying to do with each issue, the first few issues of Angels, of Angels, of Angel, there's going to be like, major first appearances and we're going to advertise them. We're not going to be coy about them, but they're going to be, um, we want to make sure people jump on those because um, a few weeks from now uh, we are going to have a pretty major Buffy angel announcement um, that I think will make you want to make sure you have the first appearances of those characters. Awesome. That's some great info for sure. My friend. I, yeah, I, I appreciate all that. I know everyone out there does. <laughs> We've talked creator owned books, and then now, obviously, the uh, Tooth Fairy secret announcement segued us beautifully into Buffy and the Angel and some of the licensed properties that Boom covers. Now, you mentioned yourself being a big uh, diehard Angel Buffy fan. Can you tell us a little bit about how Boom came to acquire the license that was, you know, long held from Dark Horse Comics? And how how big has that been for Boom to bring kind of the Buffy franchise into the fold? You know, um, I don't want to get too much into some of the business weeds because it's kind of boring and I'm not the one to speak about it. But I think, you know, um, I want to first say I think, you know, to all the for, to as on behalf of all the Buffy and Angel fans, like a uh, thank you to Dark Horse for all the great work they did with Buffy over the years. We're collecting a lot of that in what we call our legacy edition format, uh, the big, thick, square bound uh soft covers that, you know, collect uh, book issues chronologically. So we have um, the first one will be in uh, from Angel and Buffy will actually be in uh, in October for but for uh, Angel's 20th anniversary. You will see an Angel Legacy Edition that collects in chronological order some of the earliest and most rare Angel comics. We already had a Firefly Legacy Edition come out as well like that. Um, I think, you know, uh, and Christos Gage, a good friend of mine, he did, he's one of the many people who did amazing work on, on Buffy, uh, and Angel over the years. So thank you. Um, you know, what I can speak to is I think the business side is, you know, uh, licenses have terms, P uh, different companies have different ideas. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, happened to, I think, have a really good pitch for what we wanted to do with Buffy and Angel. And I'm sure other people came in with their great ideas and pitches and, that's all the contract stuff. But what I can tell you is the appeal creatively for us is um, we have a lot of people in this company who are giant Buffy and Angel fans who, who can all remember where they were when Buffy ran the sword through Angel, even though he had stopped being Angelus, but had to like, you know, save the world who all can remember the first time we saw, Oh, I got him right here. First time we all saw the puppet angel, right? Like we all remember this. Um, you know, like we all, uh, we have a lot of fans here. And I think what we all saw the opportunity was that Dark Horse had done a really good job continuing the television series, plural, um, as comics. And they've done a great job of it. And I think they ended season 12 in a really cool place. But what we looked at and said is, you know, 
how do we help a whole new generation come into comics and discover this? And I really would point to Ultimate Spider-Man, the Bendis and Bagley book, and the whole Ultimate line is a real example of how that works well. That line, um, it, you didn't, it, getting into Ultimate Spider-Man didn't mean you didn't enjoy JMS's and JRJR's Amazing Spider-Man. It just meant you had a different version of Spider-Man, and if you'd never been into him, you could you could get into that world without the um, all the continuity, right? And so it allowed us to tell story, new stories, not just including cell phones, but we got it allowed. Um, I think Janine uh, Schaefer, uh, Gavin Gronenthal, the editors on the book, and then Jordi Belera, the writer um, on Buffy, and Dan Mora, the artist, to really reimagine the characters and say, what new stories are there to tell, and how can you find new takes on the characters? So, for example. You know, um, the thing that they always say about the book is that, you know, one of the big differences had to be Willow would have a very different arc being a teenager in California, um, uh, you know, a queer teenager in California. She would have a different arc uh, because she wouldn't have to have this giant coming out story. It's L.A. It's 2019. I think we look at identity in such a different way. Um, and uh, so it allowed us to launch a series with her being already in a relationship with Rose, um, who's gonna have a pretty major role in the book as well. Um, and, you know, it allowed us to position Xander differently. It allowed Buffy to have a different relationship with Giles in that like her attitude towards um, slaying and Giles' attitude of responsibility towards her uh, could be modernized a bit. And it's probably the weakest example that I think about it, but it allowed us like Drusilla, we don't have a ma we don't have the master, right? The master is not in this comic. We have the mistress and that is Drusilla. And it allowed us to have a, this cool female villain to face off against Buffy. It allowed Spike and Cordelia to have like a different dynamic because you can see why those two might have got along. And it allowed Cordelia to even be reimagined, not as like a, um, with all respect to Charisma Carpenter's great work, it, sometimes she was more like the typical that big girl and she wasn't shown to be smart. Whereas she gets to be this beautiful, confident woman who also happens to be smart and athletically inclined, but isn't like, that stereotypical female character who, if she's beautiful, has to be shallow or cruel. And so I think what you have, again, having a book um, led by a writer as, as uh, talented as Jordi Belair, you have this um, diversity of uh, character appearances, uh, of character uh, reinventions and nuances that's really made the book, I think, such a critical darling too. And like, I'm telling you guys, that book, the attrition month over month is so minimal because readers are staying with it. And it's, um, that's really been cool to see. And I think uh, that was, we saw potential there. We saw potential to reintroduce Angel. And I think, I think vampirism itself and the questions of agency and, and uh, redemptive justice are more important than ever in this era of, uh, uh, of Me Too discussion and more questions about, um, about redemption and when, we're, when we can be redeemed. And so all those themes felt universal and we wanted to approach them again. Oh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think you mentioned, you know, you mentioned the diversity of characters. Also, you guys have brought in a diversity of cover artists. Um, issue one saw a one in 25 variant from heavyweight Jen Bartel, who's as hot as they come right now in the variant cover art game. Issue number four, which had the big angel reveal, saw Jenny Friesen doing the uh, one in 50 variant that yeah. we covered on the bowl list amazing and i was just looking at solicitations for issue five and you've got yasmin putri doing um the uh one in 25 and one in 50 and another major up and coming artist that we talk about is kind of poised to hit that next level um what are is that something that you guys are consciously out there trying to do is is get some of these big up and coming uh cover artists is it just people's love for buffy or um you know is it just kind of been a happy circumstance that it's worked out that way because you guys are putting quite a roster together. Uh, look, I'd be lying if I didn't say that we weren't aware of who's hot. Obviously, uh, you know, I mentioned Ross. I mentioned Bryce Carlson, who's our VP of editorial. We are all collectors. Okay. We have, and so like, um, you know, those are the uh, those are the ways. Like, we're always thinking about that. So we, we'd be lying if we we said that wasn't on our mind. But like, you were talking about Jenny Frizen and like. These covers didn't come about because we were chasing speculators or collectors. You know, I don't know if uh, speculator is a dirty word or not, but uh, I don't think it is. Um, and it's, uh, I think, uh, you know, we we uh, we love having speculators check out our books. But first and foremost, we always want our books to be made for the fans, for the readers. And uh, credit to Janine Schaefer. So if you don't know who she is, she was, uh, she, I've known her for 10 years. She's a really great friend of mine, 11 years. 
She was an editor at Marvel. Um, she oversaw projects from Girl Comics to the uh, to Astonishing X Men, like when when Northstar got married. Um, she spearheaded the Brian Wood uh, Olivia Quipel uh, relaunch of X Men. She oversaw a whole bunch of big X Men books. She worked on a bunch of Avengers books under Tom Brevoort. Um, she was an editor at DC who worked on uh, on uh, Count not Countdown. Uh, what was the first uh, weekly book? Fifty two, of course. Fifty two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fifty two. Uh, she worked on the Legion, which of course makes me think she's the best. She edited books like uh, Motor Crush. Um, so like she is, she has a bit of a Midas touch when it comes to this and like a sixth sense for, for, um, for finding talent. You want to know who gave Scott Snyder's first big two gig? Janine Schaefer on Iron Man Noir. That is when I wow. met Scott Snyder. So like she wow. like, yeah, she, she, she has this incredible eye for it. And she'll be so embarrassed. I'm just raving about her here. But she picks the artists. She just like, she wants, look, she wants female artists bringing the Buffy world to life. She also wants the best artists. It happens just that we're at the point in the industry where some of the top hottest artists, like you guys mentioned, are female artists. So it's right. a nice convergence yeah. of it. But like, we're always looking for cool voices. Like Kevin Watt is doing all those beautiful variants. They're almost like, uh, what's the term? For? Like, they almost look like shoujo variants if they were like manga, right? Like everybody is so pretty and beautiful. And that's not because anyone said make pretty beautiful covers. Janine's like, I want beautiful covers of the Buffy cast. I'm going to hire someone to make them for this book and people are going to love them. And, you know, that's why so many of her covers are open to order. We just want people, retailers, we want retailers to be able to order what their customers want. We want customers to get them. And yeah, we'll do some of the, you know, like uh, unlockable or ratioed, whatever you call them, variants. But really, we always want to make sure that we pick the best cover artists and that we're never just going back to the same people. So if you like Jenny Frizen in the Whedonverse, uh, stay tuned for some really, really big stuff. I got to tell you guys, though, these Slayer variants to each issue of Buffy, these have been our C cover. They've been open to order. So you should be able to find some out in the wild. We announced our Chosen Ones one shot hitting in August. So these covers, I mean, you y'all are the experts. So you can debate what if a cover is the first appearance or not. The old Spider Gwen debate, y'all figure that out. But they're <laughs> the first time you ever saw these characters is on these variant covers, and you're going to see some of these slayers who've been on variant covers make their first full appearances in all new stories in August in Buffy the Vampire Slayer: colon, The Chosen Ones, a one shot special that explores these slayers. And it actually will impact the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series too. So, you know, we don't have we weren't just doing these variants for fun. Janine knew from the minute they created these variants that each of these characters had a backstory that we were going to tell. Slayers of times past, and it's what I call them because I'm stuck in my Starman times past uh, naming conventions. But like these are Slayer variants, and like these ones, honestly, keep an eye for these because you're going to see a lot more of these Slayers making their first appearances in full length stories. But the first time you got to look at them is on these covers. So I defer to Bolo Nation on what a real first appearance is, but I'm just giving you my two cents. There you go. I like it. We're, we're, we're stacking up the Bolos today for you guys. For <laughs> right. buying options. But yeah, I think that brings me to like my, my last kind of Buffy question. It's more kind of a kind of your fantasy matchup, dream matchup. You mentioned uh, one of your close personal friends being Donnie Cates. They used the first uh, video interview I ever did for YouTube. And when I did that interview, he was wearing a Buffy shirt. And I asked him what uh, what characters he would love to write in the future. At the time, he was only uh, he was with Image. He was doing creator own stuff, uh, so it was pre Marvel. But he said the two that he would love to do were Spider Man and Buffy. So what would it take in the future to get Donny Cates to do a Buffy book for Boom? So like like I said, I, I love Donny Cates like a brother. Um, I moderated his panel at WonderCon, and we legit got into a fight about this on stage. It was not like – if for anybody who was there at the panel, we didn't orchestrate any of it. Like he revealed to me, oh, I'm going to tell you Donny Cates' story. I'm going to tell you Donny Cates' story, and it's all part of this. We were So when he was an intern at Marvel, that's when I knew him, right? That's when I first met him. And he told me he was from Texas, right? And so he's like, I was like, oh, you a Cowboys fan? And he told me, yeah. And so every Monday I would talk to him about the Dallas Cowboys and he would tell me something like, oh yeah, yeah, man, the defense, they just, they got penalized. Or man, the O-line was just falling over all the time. Cause like Tony Rome was my QB. Um, and uh, I'll go all Trello Owens on you and start crying through my shades right now. Cause that's my QB, man. 
But, uh, you know, uh, he, every Monday would come tell me stuff. And I'm not kidding you. I did not know this. Apparently every intern at Marvel knew this. 11 years later, we're on stage at WonderCon. And he's like, hey, you know, I got to tell you something I hadn't told you before. And I'm like, oh, man, is he going to tell me how much he thinks I'm a good friend? We, like, literally say I love you to each other. So, like, I'm pretty sure I know we love each other. We're family. And like, uh, like I'm very, I'm very much Dominic Toretto. I don't, I, I, I don't have friends. I got family, and I'm like, cool. Like that's good. He's a Tom, and he's like, I've been lying to you for 11 years. And Michelle sitting in the audience, and I just look at him, and I'm like, what? And he told me that apparently he used to call his dad every Sunday and be like, hey, can you just tell me a few things about the Dallas Cowboys to say to this guy? He's being real nice to me. I can't bear to tell him I don't give a crap about football. <laughs> so this is my boy Donnie Cates. We got into an argument because I correctly know that Wesley is the best watcher in the Buffyverse. Because unlike Giles, he doesn't let his slayers get killed. And so and he doesn't let Buffy get killed multiple times. Uh, sure, Faith goes evil, but come on. So we got into this whole argument about it, and he, I know he is, his love for Buffy goes deep. His love for Giles in particular runs deep. Um, when he was uh, living here in L.A., he went and uh, visited the high school where they filmed Buffy, the exterior of Buffy. And, like, uh, he had took photos there because he loves it so much. Um, look, man, uh, I talk to the guy all the time. Uh, I, I would personally love for him to do it. But if I'm being honest with you, like uh, there's such a there's such a crazy, well mapped out plan for the Buffy verse right now. Um, there are no Donny Cates plans at the moment for Buffy. Never say never. He loves Buffy. Uh, you know, we love Donny. Um, and like I would personally as his friend, I would love to uh, I would love to have an excuse to work with him um, all the time. But uh, he's, uh, he, I think he's got his hands full with uh, Absolute Carnage right now. I think he's, him and Ryan are planning to sell over 8.1 million copies of that. So I think let's do, let Donnie get through selling that and breaking a Guinness record. And then we can talk to him about how much time he's got for, uh, for other stuff. <laughs>